All right, before you head out on New Year's Eve for a big celebration that night, you definitely have time to squeeze in this 12.30 kickoff Eastern time in the Advocare V100 Bowl. I'm going to refer to it as the Independence Bowl because for those of us who have been around a while, we remember the Independence Bowl down in Shreveport, Louisiana. And this year we've got uh, the BC Eagles taking on uh, the Arizona Wildcats in an ACC Pac-12 matchup, and I always love to compare the conferences and see who wins some of these, uh, especially lower-tier, second-tier matchups. And Brian Pavat is here to uh, help us break it down. Brian writes for BC Interruption on the SB Nation, and we'll get his expert uh, take on Boston College preparation for the bowl game. Brian, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me, Mark. Glad to be on. Brian, we talked incentive with a number of bloggers regarding their teams in bowl games, depending on the specific bowl. But with BC coming off that 2-10 and 10 campaign, Steve Adazio has done a remarkable job, at least from an outside perspective, in preparing this team, getting them ready, being very competitive in the ACC this year with a 7-5 and five record. So, so your take on, on the job that he's done and the mindset of the football team, they've got to be excited for this bowl matchup. Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, anytime you take a team from 2-10 and 10 to 7-5, and five, um, using largely the same uh, roster of talent, I think that's the most uh, remarkable thing that Steve Adazio has done this year is, uh, you know, we added uh, Matt Patchen out of Florida. He was a grad student uh, on the O-line. Uh, but other than that, um, you know, we lost more than we, we gained uh, on the roster. Um, and to turn around a season from 2-10 and 10 to 7-5 and five has been pretty remarkable. Um, in general, I think it's just been a, a, a huge mindset and a mentality change uh, with the team. Um, you know, Adazio is a New England guy. I think he gets it. I think he's, you know, extremely happy to be at BC. Um, and he's really gotten the most out of, out of the players. I mean, I think, um, you know, the regular season finale over Syracuse, they were in a position to win eight games. Um, Andre Williams went out on the first play of the second half uh, with a shoulder injury. Um, so that's, that's pretty remarkable. Uh, to put that in a little bit of perspective, um, the, the two wins to seven wins uh, matches a, a single uh, year-over-year single-season uh, program best uh, as far as single-season turnarounds. Um, so to be put in a position uh, in the regular season finale, I think, to get to uh, plus six wins year-over-year has been a you know, truly incredible experience. And uh, you know, all the credit goes to Adazio and his coaching staff. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens next. Uh, you know, Adazio loses a lot of talent uh, from the previous uh, staff, and I think you know Eagles fans are expecting a little bit of a, a, a step back in the next couple of years. Um, but you know, this this season has been a, a resounding success. Uh, you know, I can't sing Adazio's praises enough this year, uh, just with building the buzz and excitement around the program and really getting fans. You know, kind of excited and, and back uh, into Boston College football. And Brian, you mentioned the seven wins and almost eight with the last second loss to Syracuse in the finale without Andre Williams for most of the game. But what might be a little bit more impressive than the seven wins were two very tough losses against Florida State and Clemson. You look at those Clemson games, they did lose the last one against uh, South Carolina, but specifically Florida State, completely annihilating everybody in their path in the ACC, including a legitimate top 10, top 12 team in Clemson. Those are two impressive efforts that uh, BC put on the board against Florida State and against Clemson. No, oh, absolutely. I think the, the Florida State game surprised a lot of people. Um, you know, and I, I, I would really point to that game as kind of the, the coming out party for Adazio and the Eagles. Um, so they jumped out on Florida State pretty early. I think they went up 17-3 uh, after the first quarter. Um, and really, other than... Uh, uh, so on the last play of the, the, the first half, uh, Winston uh, escaped pressure and had, quote-unquote, a Heisman moment where uh, he threw a uh, Hail Mary to, I think it was Kenny Shaw. Um, so that, that put uh, Florida State up two touchdowns, I believe, at halftime. Uh, but that was a close game up until, you know, the third quarter. And I think, um, uh, you know, I think uh, Auburn fans look at that game and say, hey, Florida State, like, uh, their closest uh, win was against uh, Boston College. You know, they're not that good. But um, I, I think it was a good matchup of uh, uh, Boston College's power running game against uh, Florida State. Uh, I think, I believe Mario Edwards wasn't there for that game. 
so that factored into it as well. Uh, but it was really a, a really a tough fought loss for for BC, and you know you hate to throw around the moral victory label, but um, you know I think looking back, I think the team and and Adazi and the coaching staff are pretty proud of that effort. Uh, you know, being able to to play Florida State the closest of anyone so far, uh, and who knows, might be the the closest of anyone all year. Yeah, definitely. And and again, that Clemson effort. I believe that game was like 17-14 until very late in the ball game, and you lost by 10 in that one. Uh, Brian, I'm going to make a big assumption here. Before we move on to the the specific matchup against Arizona in the bowl game, when you take a team that's gone two and ten and gotten trampled by most opponents. They did have some close games in 2012. Then on the brink of eight wins, seven wins, the two games that we just mentioned, and generally the same supporting cast on the field that Adazio did a remarkable job. I would assume that this is a team maybe a little short on athleticism but doing all the right things, extremely well coached, not committing penalties, not turning the football over would be the assumption. Yeah, that's that's correct, Mark. Um, so I think uh, I don't think they are anymore. But for a long stretch of the uh, season, they were at least penalized team in the country. Uh, so Dazio is really kind of preaching that discipline and uh, limiting the mental mistakes. Um, you know, and with a with a roster of talent that might not be as uh, talented as some of the others in the conference, um, and particularly you know also against USC uh, in non conference play, you know that that becomes important. Um, I think the biggest thing that Adazio and, and uh, offensive coordinator Ryan Day really did was um, they did a remarkable job of playing to the strengths of the offense. Um, so they saw, you know, they saw this potential in Andre Williams um, as kind of a bruising uh, running back. Um, and with the addition of Matt Patchen, you know, they, they really coached up the offensive line to the point where um, we could have a 2,000-yard rusher. So, um, and that, that, that's... Um, that's interesting in the fact that, you know, BC's never had a 2,000-yard a, a rusher, um, you know, and going back to the long line of, you know, offensive line U and, and some talented running backs that have come here. So uh, I think it, w- it was more than just a fluke kind of season um, and kind of like running Andre into the ground. Um, there was definitely some talent there, and I think that what they – the best thing that they did was to kind of scheme around that, that talent and, and kind of instill a power running game. Um, because if um, if people remember, like the the Boston College offense looked very different a year ago, uh, where uh, offensive coordinator Doug Martin, who's now at, uh, the head coach at New Mexico State, uh, liked to throw the ball around. Uh, it was very much uh, passed to set up the run, um, and uh, Spaziani went through a number of running backs uh, that season, where uh, we eventually settled on um, for long long stretches due to injury and benchings. Uh, David Dudak, who's our uh, converted uh, defensive back. Um, so I think you know that that's really, from an offensive standpoint, that's really what Adazio and Day um, have done well. Um, and I would add that you know that's not necessarily where I think they want the offense to go. Um, but when they came into the situation, they saw you know bruising running back in Andre Williams, uh, an experienced offensive line, you know plug in Matt Patchen uh, at one of the guard positions. Um, and and a limited number of weapons at wide receiver, um, so they they've kind of changed it, um, you know, almost a 360, where where uh, Reddick was slinging the ball around and Amadon had a career year, uh, to where you know now Andre Williams and the and the offensive line are really having a a career year. Brian, I'm going to wow you right now with my research, my in-depth analysis. I'm going to let you know something that you probably don't know, but we we feature two of the best running backs in the country in this game with Kadeem Carey for Arizona, who racked up 17 touchdowns, 1,700 yards, Mm -hmm. and uh, also with uh, Andre Williams, 2,100 yards, the 16th back in NCAA history with 2,000 yards. Of course, I'm kidding. This is the obvious storyline here with these two great running backs going at it. We talked a lot about Andre Williams uh, and what he did this year, getting into the the Heisman talk, the, the tremendous efforts down the stretch leading into that Syracuse game. I think 339 against NC State, like 900 over the course of three games. He was amazing, even running against Florida State for, I believe, around a buck fifty. So mm-hmm. we talked a little bit about Andre Williams. Let's focus to the defense. Your, your thoughts on defending uh, Kadeem Carey and BC's ability to do that? I know they gave up some rushing yardage in that finale to Syracuse. Yeah, it'll be interesting. So I think in the Syracuse game, the the rushing yards, uh, 
I don't think their running back ran for 100 yards, but I do think Terrell Hunt uh, kind of burned them on the ground. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. I think Terrell Hunt and uh, B.J. Denker are, are similar quarterbacks in that respect. Um, and B.C. traditionally, uh, going back a few years, has, has really struggled to kind of defend the, the mobile quarterback. Um, so I think they're going to get their yards. I think probably Denker is going to get uh, a number of carries too. Um, I'm less concerned about carry. I, I know he's going to get his yards, but um, I really think that it's going to be um, on the quarterback. So, you know, BC's done a good job, r remarkably good job this year um, at stopping the run. Uh, where they've struggled mightily is, is in pass coverage. So um, for sure, defensive coordinator Don Brown came in um, he's known for his attack style defenses, you know, high pressure, get to the quarterback, um, and kind of, uh, you know, basically sell out the defense to uh, scheme to get to the quarterback. Um, you know, a year ago, Boston College's defense was dead last in the country in sacks. They're probably right around there in tackles for loss. Um, and this year, um, under Don Brown, you know, those numbers have completely changed. So I think they're in the top 35. Um, in both sacks and tackles for loss this year. So uh, the defense is, is highly predicated on, on getting to the quarterback and getting to them fast. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how that um, plays out in the bowl game. So I think uh, I'd probably say that Syracuse is the, is the most similar um, offensive attack we've seen this year. Uh, I think we went into the Florida State game thinking Winston would run. Uh, obviously when you have uh, the wide receivers as talented as Winston has. You, you don't need to run. You can just kind of sit back in the pocket and pitch it around. Um, and Logan Thomas uh, at Virginia Tech, I think he also struggled to run the ball, but um, he threw for like 300 yards or something. So um, in that sense, I think that's uh, that plays to BC's strength because I'm not sure uh, how Denker um, really projects as a, as a quarterback. I, uh, I've seen limited film on him. You know, it doesn't seem like he has quite the arm that Reddick does. Um, so, you know, if BC can kind of scheme to stop the run um, and make Denker beat them in the air, uh, I think the defense will have a chance. I think where they run into problems is, you know, in this pass coverage, and it, when they don't get to the quarterback, um, they really leave the secondary and the and the linebackers have to dry in pass coverage a bit. Well, despite the strength of the Pac-12, I think that the Boston College has held up much better against formidable opponents than Arizona. Arizona had that one standout game in the next to the last game of the season when they just ripped through Oregon unexpectedly 42-16. Other than that, uh, ripped by Arizona State, they, they've just had rough times even in going 4-5 and five in what many people consider the second best conference in college football. They went 4-5, and five, which is pretty respectable, but they beat who they were supposed to beat outside of Oregon and really got shredded by just about everybody else uh, in, in regards to that. Uh, looking, one last question about the defense that I have is, are we looking at a veteran defense where these guys are trying to finish off their college careers in style, or a lot of young guys, or, or what's the mix on defense in regards to experience? Yeah, so there's a lot of experience uh, in Boston College's defensive line. I think we have two or three seniors that will be playing in our last game, um, and also a lot of experience in the linebacking core. So uh, two guys to keep an eye on, Kevin Pierre-Louis um, and Steele DeVito. Uh, really talented linebackers, kind of in the Luke Keekley mold. Um, so they played with Keekley a bit, um, and really, really kind of clog up the middle and, and do a lot of things um, as far as uh, getting a lot of tackles and, and really uh, keeping things in check in the in the uh, in the on the second level. Um, defensive backs are a little uh, more green, um, so I, I I don't even think there's one senior there. So um, you know, but that said, uh, they do have a bit of experience. I think the last couple years we've played a lot of fresh, uh, even true freshmen, uh, redshirt freshmen and sophomores back there. Um, but that that's the one unit that's uh, really been exposed this year. Um, I think with the with the pass defense, so um, it'll be interesting to see. I think uh, BC has a formidable task to rebuild the defensive line. Um, so, I, and I think that's where. Uh, they actually got away from that in the last couple of years. So you're coming off of, you know, even four or five years ago, you're coming up with guys like B.J. Raji and, and Ron Brace kind of clogging up the middle and, and being really stout against the run. Um, so they've struggled in recent years to recruit defensive tackles. 
um, and really you know, clog up the middle. Um, and I think the, the strength has really shifted to the linebacking core where you've had guys like Keekley and, and Mark Herzlick and now uh, DeVito and KPL. Um, those, are, those are really the, been the stars of the defense, and I think we've moved away from kind of uh, building up the defensive line. That's going to be important in the next couple of years. Uh, some of us got a chance to see Matt Ryan almost pull off a win in San Francisco <laughs> last year. He being the quarterback who last quarterback to win uh, in a bowl game for Boston College back in 2007 against Michigan State. And as soon as I saw that note, I remember watching that game. Uh, and I think Brian Hoyer was on the other side for Michigan yeah. State, but uh, BC win uh, with Matt Ryan, a quarterback, who's not exactly a gray beard in the NFL, but he's been around a while. Now yeah. looking at his uh, replacement a couple times removed, Chase Reddick, uh, in his senior season, and correct me if I'm wrong, you kind of mentioned, um, not necessarily, I'm being very stereotypical, saying that he had a gunslinger approach or had to have that last year versus game manager this year, but but with the emergence of the running game and the offensive line taking charge of the running game uh, has been able to more game manage, 17 touchdowns and six picks. But it, it from an outside perspective, it would seem to be a nice story for Chase Reddick to go through all these rough times that he's had to endure throughout his career uh, with some... Um, less than uh, marginal football teams, and then to build this thing up and in one year turn it around and cap it off with a bowl win would be a nice story for him. Oh, absolutely. I think, uh, so, um, this, yeah, so Reddick played uh, the fr a bowl game in his freshman year. Um, so I think three games in, he's, he uh, got the start against Notre Dame uh, in 2010. Um, they lost that game at, at, uh, at BC. Um, and then they ended up in the they they plummeted down the um, the ACC's bowl pecking order. They ended up in the uh, whatever the San Francisco Bowl was called at the time. I don't think it was Fight Hunger. I think it was still probably the Emerald bowl. bowl. Yeah. Oh, that was um, Pete Carroll's last game, I believe. Uh, no, so that was the year before. So they actually played back to back games uh, in San Francisco. Uh, Reddick's freshman year was against Nevada, um, and Colin Kaepernick, ironically enough. Um, so um, that was kind of a coming out party for him, um, and wasn't a great game. But they lost uh, twenty to thirteen. Um, so for Reddick to come all the way back, you know, didn't play in a bowl game his sophomore year, his junior year, um, to come back and and compete uh, in the Independence Bowl, I think against a, a pretty good opponent um, in Arizona. In Arizona, I think you know that that would be a, a a good achievement for him, and I think for all the seniors, I think they're looking forward to. You know, getting getting back to a bowl game, and and they've really taken pride in kind of being the the class that that brought BC back a bit. Um, so from going you know six and, and eighteen over the last two years to uh, seven and five on the doorstep of eight and four, and uh, hopefully with an eighth win in the in the bowl game, I think that's something that that's a point of pride for them, and something that you know is really going to get them uh, kind of ready to go for the for the for the eye bowl. Hey Brian, before we let you go. Uh, I think we've got a number of different classes of fans who watch these bowl games. Of course, you've got the the fans of the two schools watching. Then you've got knuckleheads like me who just watch as many bowl games as possible. Then you've got uh, guys that scout the NFL, uh, kind of consider themselves kind of uh, um, novice scouts of sorts that that look for NFL prospects. Then you got those people that, that uh, and probably yourself, I'm going to throw you in this category as, as well as being a, a super BC fan and insider that uh, you're probably looking to see who's going to emerge, who are those really young guys who got some playing time this year, but you really want to see step up and play well in a bowl game that you're going to see in 2014 and 15. So mm -hmm. any NFL draft prospects for BC right now, uh, Andre Williams would be the obvious one, but uh, anybody else on the radar and anybody that you would like to see a young guy or to step up and really play well that you're excited about seeing in 2014 and beyond? Yeah, so um, aside from Williams, Williams is the obvious. So I think Williams, with his incredible season this year, has played his way from you know, maybe undrafted free agent to you know, uh, third, fourth rounder. I'm not, you know, I don't purport to be an NFL draft expert, but I, I do believe he's on the radar of some NFL scouts now with uh, the season that he's had. Um, another guy to keep an eye on um, is uh, wide receiver Alex Amidon. So um, I, know I mentioned before, but he's gone from like uh, I'm not sure how many yards he finished with, but like a thousand, over a thousand uh, receiving yards last year to 
um, kind of more role player, so where he's throwing blocks for Andre Williams, um, and they're really utilizing him more in uh, play action and kind of uh, uh, so kind of lulling them to sleep with you know handing it, keep feeding it to Andre Williams, and then Bernie over the top with play action to uh, Amadon. He's a really talented receiver. Um, he's he's sort uh, sort of undersized, but runs really good routes, um, and he's really been Reddick's. Uh, go-to target for the last couple of years. Uh, we'll be interesting to see you know, uh, whether NFL teams give him a look. Uh, might be a late, uh, late round draft pick or uh, undrafted free agent. But um, BC hasn't had a lot of success with right, wide receivers uh, in the NFL. But I think you know Amidon has a has a really the chance to to kind of catch on. Um, as far as underclassmen that uh, I'd like to see step up. Um, so I think one of the guys to keep an eye on is linebacker uh, Sean Dugan. So um, where uh, and Stephen Daniels. So those two guys are gonna really step in and uh, take the spot of uh, Devito and uh, Kevin Pierre Louis next year. Um, so it'll be interesting to see you know how they perform uh, this year against an Arizona team that can really you know spread you out and um, you're gonna be looking for you know guys that can uh, track down Kerry and Denker and, and really make those tackles uh, you know, uh, in, the back, uh, in the second level. All right, very good, Brian. He is Brian Favat. He writes for BC Interruption on the SB Nation. I've checked out a number of the articles. It's really good stuff. Uh, I'm sure he's very happy seeing Boston College back in postseason play, taking on Arizona on New Year's Eve. It's a 1230 game with Kadeem Carey in the spotlight against Andre Williams. It should be a ground-and-pound game, and also Chase Reddick playing his last game at BC. Brian, thanks so much for the information. It was great. We appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on, and uh, happy holidays. Same to you.